Thank you. Bonjour. Je m'appelle Laurent. Je suis ici pour parler de everything I learned about dynamic scaling of cloud apps. And don't worry, that's all the French I'm going to use. And I'd like to talk about everything I learned about dynamic scaling of cloud apps from working with boy bands. Now, you might go, wait, wait, what? Did he just say boy bands? And I said, yes, I did. And actually, when you think about it, boy bands are probably a great way that you can, think, that you can experiment with scaling and you can understand scalability because they have fanatic following, they have huge following, and that the, the followers will do whatever the boy band actually asks them to do. And to give one example of this was uh, there was this event last November. Uh, they've asked me, by the way, to walk around the stage a little bit, and I'm worried because this is a theater and they usually have a trap door somewhere. So if I vanish in the middle of my talk, please forgive me, I'll, I'll come back. And so, um, but they, this boy band had this event back in November announcing release of their latest album. It was a seven hour live stream. The boy band are called One Direction. Ah! <laughs> and uh, One Direction, if you're not familiar with them, one of the things they're really famous for is that they're so goofy. And so during this, one, this seven hour live stream, they tried to do things like breaking the world record for stacking toilet rolls. They actually failed, which was a shame because I'd like to have seen them break it. Uh, but what they wanted to do alongside this seven-hour live stream was to have a second screen application. And the second screen application was a quiz. Now, the nice thing about a quiz is that, um, well, first of all, this quiz was like questions every 10 minutes. And the nice thing about a quiz like this for the band was that they could ask their fans to go and answer questions. And then once the question was answered, they were done with the second screen app, and then they're back to the mainstream. So, this provides a really interesting experiment in scalability because you end up getting lots of really tall, really skinny spikes. And when you think about the, I don't know if you're familiar with this band, but they have many, many millions of fans around the world. And we were projecting that, you know, we could have one of the biggest live streams in history while we were building this thing. So um, when we have people being driven by the band to this application, now we're, in, we're challenged with this great opportunity to build a really, really scalable app. So the traffic for this app would look something like this. <laughs> OK? You don't want to sit on one of these spikes because it would hurt. And so like every 10 minutes, um, we'd have nothing, 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 except for the occasional completely psychotic fan who wanted to get there first and see if they could catch the questions and see if they could get called out by the band as being one of the best fans. But other than that, would have practically zero traffic and then boom, would have these huge spikes every 10 minutes. Now, a challenge for building an application like that. Okay, now if you're gonna plan for scalability or if you're gonna plan for capacity for an application like this, you might say, you know, you might do some kind of analysis and predict like, okay, what if we think we're gonna have about 600,000 concurrent users hitting this thing? And that's the red line that we have there. Now what happens if you build a traditional infrastructure to handle something like this? Well, two really bad things happen. The first one, of course, is that all that black space that you're seeing underneath the red line, other than the orange spikes, is effectively wasted capacity. You're paying for all that compute space, but you're not using it. And then even worse, when you actually do need to use it, if the spike penetrates the capacity that you've planned for, now you have really unhappy fans. And I don't know if you know what fans of boy bands are like, but if you make them unhappy, your life could be in danger. <laughs> so, so you do want to plan for, like, if, say we had a pessimistic plan, so like the green line here, and then that's great. Now we can handle all this capacity. We can handle all these spikes. But look at all the black space in this diagram, and that's wasted capacity. And that's part of the promise of the cloud, right, so that you can scale according to what you actually need to use. But this is traffic capacity. And now let's start thinking about this in terms, instead of traffic capacity, what about compute capacity? Now, if you, I'm, I can't see with the lights, so I'm not going to ask you guys to show hands, but um, for those of you who are software developers, when you think about a challenge like this, you've got to think about how you're going to use the compute capacity to handle all these questions coming in from people. And if you do it very inefficiently, you could end up with compute capacity looking a little bit like this. The first question comes in, you get hundreds of thousands of users, and you don't finish processing all of those hundreds of thousands of users by the time the second question comes in. And then your spike gets higher, and then you don't finish processing them by the time the third spike comes in, and you end up with this ugly staircase of capacity. And you can't plan for that capacity, even with the green line that I'd had here, you know, sooner, sooner or later you're gonna break through that green line and disaster ensues. So the promise of the cloud and the promise of like vendors such as ourselves who talk about the cloud say, well, we can scale for you. We can manage scale for you. And it will look something like this. So in, when you build something using platform as a service, um, from Google, we call it App Engine, um, what happens is we spin up virtual machines in the cloud based on your traffic 
so that we can manage capacity for you. And you end up getting something like this. So you got nothing, and then you got this big spike, and then as your capacity needs go down, the number of virtual machines that we spin up for you goes down also. But it doesn't solve the underlying problem, because you still end up paying for all of the space under the red line here. It's a lot less than you would have paid for previously, but it's still pretty bad. So um, one of the things that with the promise of scalability and the promise of cloud computing is that scalability isn't just about moving up. It's also about moving down effectively. So what your cloud vendor can do for you is that they can manage these virtual machines and they can do these for you. But you as a software developer have to build your software effectively to be able to take advantage of this and maybe so that your scalability goes with these kind of tall, skinny spikes that we're looking at. So now if we look at something like this. Now, if all you're paying for is the compute capacity underneath the red line, you're not going to be paying a whole lot of money to be able to run an application like this. So the big question as a developer or as an architect is, well, how the heck do I do that? How do I get that kind of scalability that goes up as well as that kind of scalability that goes down? So for an application such as the one that we built, this quiz application, you know, the big thing here was really the data. So let's start with the data and let's start thinking about the options that are available for data and for managing data in a scenario like this one. First of all, you've got a SQL database. Now, a SQL database, from the point of view of the record company in this case, was fabulous because the SQL database would be able to write all of the data about who answered the question, what they answered, where they were from, what their gender was, what their name was, what their city was, did they get the answer right, did they get the answer wrong, and they end up with this huge database of information. If you think about the millions of fans, each one answering maybe 42 questions, you have this huge database of information that they can slice and dice. They can run queries against to say, you know, um, tell me people in Paris called Sylvain who are the number one, um, one Direction fan. You know, the, the, they can run those kind of really, really detailed queries. And part of what they wanted to do with the data was while the show was running, that they would have like a, a ticker running across the bottom of the screen saying, hey, people in France were the best at answering question number two, whereas people in the United States were the best at answering question number three. So this was really, really good for the record company, but really, really bad for the application. Because when you think about all those writes that you would have to do in a short space of time, that it could get difficult and you could end up with those fat curves instead of those skinny curves. So then there was NoSQL. Now, NoSQL, I love NoSQL, and I'm sure half the audience or most of the audience here loves NoSQL as much as I do, but we could face similar problems with NoSQL when it came to writing. If we have like a spike of a million people in the space of a few seconds and we got to write out their answers, we were a little bit worried about how NoSQL would perform under those circumstances. And then finally, the easiest and fastest was the file system. You can write things to a file system, and every cloud vendor offers some kind of file storage. But that didn't really work for the record company, because it's really, really hard to run the kind of queries that I was talking about if all of the answers are stored in flat files. So what do we do? And we, we kind of scratched our heads a little bit, and then we thought about memory caching. Now, if you're familiar with memory caching, it's an option that's available from you know, most platform as a service. Uh, offerings, and from Google's offering, we actually have what we call a dedicated memcache. So it, where memcache is generally something that's temporary, you write, and you don't know when it's going to be thrown away. It's something you use for short-term variables. For a live event like this, where we're running for seven hours, and we want to keep all that data for at least those seven hours, you know, a temporary memcache didn't really work, but a dedicated memcache would. Of course, the downside of that is you've got to pay for it, right? So usually the temporary ones are cheap or free. The dedicated ones you actually have to pay for. But there were a lot of positives around this. Number one is really, really fast. You're writing to RAM. And what could be easier than that, right? So you're just throwing stuff into memory. It's very, very easy. As a developer, you know, it's a one line of code to set a variable in RAM. But challenges, like I mentioned, where memcache can be very, very volatile. So if you have a dedicated memcache offering, it's good. But the bigger challenge came with when, write, when using memcache for something like this, you're no longer writing records. You've got this key value pair architecture. So that, that made us think about, you know, we had to change some of the design of the application, and we had some challenges around the requirements. So we went back to the record company, and we were asking them, well, what is it that you really want to do with this data? I mean, do you really want to run a query that says, you know, give me everybody between the age of 13 and a half and 14 and a half who lives in a certain district of Paris who answered question 16 correct? Or do you just want to have this kind of summary level, summary level data that shows you the kind of interesting things you can put on a ticker? You know, the number one fans of the band are in the United States or in the Philippines or in Mexico or whatever. And when we did this kind of clarification, and it's a very, very important part of any software development, and I'd argue it's probably even more important now than ever because of uh, the needs of scalability in the cloud, uh, then we realized that, you know, 
the requirements that the record company had around capturing the data were probably not nearly as stringent as we had expected. So that gave us the ability to sit down and think about how do we design capturing all this data, capturing quiz data in particular, with this type of scale using a key value pair architecture. So many compromises against requirements that I've actually mentioned, but also we had to write a lot of code that we wouldn't have normally had to write. So we had to write a lot of code to actually track all the variables because we have a key, which is the name of the variable, for example, question one, which this age group, this country, did they get it right, yes or no? And you know, increment a counter for that. And think about all the variables that you'd want for the type of axes of data. You know, people from various countries, what they answered, um, who answered question one right, who answered it wrong, gender, age, all that kind of stuff. Whereas, like, if we were using SQL, it's very easy for us to just throw it into a, a database record and then do all that kind of figuring out who did what by the query later on when we when we pull the data out. So there was a lot of extra code needed to be written to be able to do that. And then there was the concept of sharding was necessary in high volume. Now sharding, if you're not familiar with it, is the concept of splitting a variable up into multiple variables that you can then put back together later. And I'll show you the reason for that in a moment. But first, let's take a look at some code. Oh good, it is readable. I was worrying about the, the green and black there for a second. So for example, what we ended up doing for a, a memory cache uh, type of uh, coding would be, for example, like we would end up generating an age key like this one where it's question one, age, bucket number two, got it wrong, and that's a variable that we increment or decrement. Instead of storing complex records in uh, memory cache, we realize it's a lot easier for us just to store numbers. And if we use the memcache.increment here in Python, that's a really, really fast operation because we're not reading, changing, and then writing. We just write, 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 write. And so as a result, it could be really, really quick. But we end up writing a lot of code like this to actually generate the keys. Now, what's the downside with doing something like this? I have a single key here for question one, age bucket two, got it wrong. Right? So just for argument's sake, say 50% of people get the question wrong. Now what happens is, if we have a million people answering the question, this variable in memcache is being hammered half a million times in just a few seconds. That's a lot of hot hammers on a memcache variable, and that's a problem. And that's where sharding would come in. Now sharding sounds really complicated, but it's actually very, very simple. And in this case, it's like we said, okay, we'll just generate a random number between one and 100, and we'll add that onto the end of the variable. So now we have 100 different variables for handling this question one, age one, is it right or is it wrong? And then like just stick a random number on the end of that. So now those hundred variables, instead of us, in the case of half a million hits on a single variable, we now have half a million hits across a hundred variables spread at random. And as a result, we're not hitting the same part of memory, this hot memory variable like uh, half a million times, for example, in the case of just a few seconds. And here's another example. So when we started thinking about, okay, countries, uh, when we negotiated with the record company, it was like they were thinking they wanted to track every fan in every country. And then we're thinking, okay, let's pick a random country, and I picked the country of Cyprus. And an interesting coincidence, I picked the country of Cyprus because I was born there, and an interesting coincidence was the person from the record company was born there too. So it was just one of those, you know, like those elevator question problems, like people who share birthdays, we were both born in the same country, total coincidence. And we're saying, okay, well, like, what if only 300 fans in this country answer a question? Should we really be, do we really need to track something like that? And it turned out that we didn't. So we wrote some code and we said we took a look at the data and we picked the top 30 countries <coughs> you know, that the record company wanted to track and then we put everybody else in the rest of the world bucket. So when the token came in with an answer from a quiz and we looked at the country, we just checked it against the countries list and if it wasn't in the countries list, we called it rest of the world, which you can see in the code behind me. And if it was in the countries list, then we started looking, okay, what are the most popular countries in the world for this band? And the four most popular countries were the United Kingdom, the United States, Mexico, and Brazil. So when it came to sharding, now the nice thing we can do is instead of having the same number of shards per country, we could just say, if you're in the United Kingdom, the United States, Mexico, Brazil, or the rest of the world, we're gonna give it 16 shards. Everywhere else, we're just gonna give it four shards. And then as a result, we can build up a key. And like in the example here is the key was UK3 correct seven. And we can start incrementing that key. And you can see I'm still using memcache.increment because we found that instead of putting complex objects into memcache, it was much easier and much quicker, more importantly, for us to stick a numeric variable in there that we would just increment. We don't have to pull the data out, amend it, and push it back in. We just increment that variable. And then finally, the, one of the... Uh, Interesting side effects that we had with this 
was that thinking about storing personal data. Now, most of the fans of this band are teenagers. I have a teenage daughter myself, and my teenage daughter and I watched the, the live stream together, and as I was thinking as we were watching this, that it's really nice that when she was answering the 42 questions, that there aren't 42 records being stored in a database of her usage of the internet somewhere. Um, by moving towards this key value pair architecture, we were just capturing the data that we wanted to display. But one of the things that, was, that the band wanted to do was that when somebody had a high score, if somebody had answered all the questions perfectly, or if people had the highest score in the world at that time, if they weren't all answered perfectly, they wanted to keep a hero list so they could call it out on air. You know, they could call out, hey, Sylvain in Paris is the number one One Direction fan in the world. By the way, at the party tonight, apparently, he's going to be singing some of their songs. And, uh, you know, the, so in order for us to be able to do this, we kept what we call the hero list. And the hero list, as you can see, is very, very simple code. We just kept an array of 32 variables, and then as fans with the high score came in, we stuck it into that, and we sharded that. And so we only had to keep personal details for 32 fans at a time instead of millions and millions of fans at a time. So it was really good from a privacy perspective, and the band and the record company still got to do what they wanted to do. So in the end, when building with an architecture like this, we were able to go back to do this kind of thing. So when we have these tall, skinny spikes, now because we're using memcache, because we're, keep, we're storing the data that we want, we're intelligently thinking about the data that we want to actually capture and storing that, now as a result, our architecture or our, our, a, uh, our traffic usage would look something like this. So these red lines are the virtual machines that have been spun up by the cloud for us, and the blue lines here are the spikes that you can see. And the cost of actually executing this application ended up being you know, very, very low, and it's just what's below the lines here. Now, I'm not allowed to share the actual dollar value that it costs, the dollar amount that it costs to actually run this application, but I will say a bunch of us went out for drinks afterwards and so, uh, to celebrate the successful implementation, and the drinks bill was actually higher than the cloud bill for running the application itself, which, you know, which to me, that's the very definition of success as a software developer, right? If your drinks cost more than your cloud expenses. And so, uh, ju so just to wrap up, uh, just talk about, like, we, in, the cloud age that we're in now, we tend to think about scalability, and scalability is something that's done automatically by your cloud vendor, and that is true. But as a software developer, it's your responsibility, and it's your scale, and frankly, that's really what we get paid for, to really drive value in that, that by thinking about how you build your application so that your traffic usage is, ma is uh, manageable, so that you, know, you end up with an architecture like this one, is, uh, it's a, you know, that's one of the skills that you can bring to the table, and it's something that I recommend everybody does, that you know, we, we need to fundamentally rethink sometimes how we build applications so that we can manage scale. Secondly, scale, we tend, whenever we talk about scale, we tend to think scale is just all about getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But scale is also about getting smaller, effectively. You know, in an application such as this one, it was nice that we had all these skinny spikes to show us that. And I recommend, again, as a developer, to think about don't think the luxury that you have with cloud of, you know, the cloud managing scale for you and the cloud spinning up virtual machines when you need them is great. But also think about how you build your application so it spins them right down again so you can save money so that your drinks bill ends up being higher than your cloud bill. So with that, I just want to say thank you very much, everybody, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.